Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Lindsay, thanks for taking the time out today to join me on the show. Great pleasure. Um, we're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about business, the lessons learned. Um, there's so much, obviously, that we're going to try and pack into around about an hour, maybe even an hour and a half of conversation. Uh, we just won't do your experience and, and I guess your wisdom justice. But what I'd like to do is just to kind of cast your mind back to your early days, set the scene for our listeners and myself who haven't heard your story before, because obviously it's quite remarkable. You've been a business leader for such a long time. You've got many accolades um, and achievements over that time. So just tell us a bit about the, the younger Lindsay, um, how you came to be involved in, in ceramics and business. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, when I was at um, primary school, there was a, a potter that lived a couple of doors down from our house and we used to walk past her every afternoon and, you know, some days she'd let us you know, play with the potter's wheel and would, would make some things and then we'd always want to look in the kiln and see what had come out that day and she ran classes and things. And then a few years later, my father got involved in it as well and he set himself up and so um, I was always sort of around it and he used to take us out on trips and um, looking at gemstones and you know looking at, at, at those sorts of things so and we also did a lot of mechanical things so I was sort of a bit of a, a bit of a freak um, and my mother was an artist and um, and uh, you know, I'll come back and explain why that was, that was important but anyhow so um, when I got to the point I finished about to finish high school and want to go to university I had a friend that was doing ceramic engineering and I never heard about it but it was a really exciting field where there was um, you know, the, the lining, the, the outer skin of the space shuttle and uh, silicon chips and all these sort of really, you know, scientific advances were going on. Um, but, you know, I was also looked at things like civil engineering and there was a thousand kids going to civil engineering and there was only like less than half a dozen doing ceramic engineering. So I thought if you're going to stand out, um, you know, if I go into ceramic engineering, I've got a much better chance of standing out. And as it turned out, there was a year of six and two of us became... You know, both managing directors of public companies and so it was a really great a great year a lot of the others went into um, research and stuff they didn't have the sort of personality for, for being in, in public life and business but yeah so that's how I, that's how I started um, and 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 uh, as brick making is a little bit of, of it's um, there's mechanical side to it there's there's the science of actual what's going on in the chemical reactions and of course if you want to sell a fashion product, you better have some idea of art. So, so that's what I said, a bit of a freak. So I had the sort of the basis of, of everything that was required to do this job. Mm. It sounds like you, yeah, you, you had the, the right recipe, the combination, if you like. Um, mm. I've heard you say on a, on a previous interview that you did, you, and this is a quote, um, and I think I got this right. You said, I always wanted to be proud and give value to my clients. And then you, mm. you, you, got, you went on to say how, you know, bricks are kind of the ultimate value for, for a client because they stand the test of time. Mm. Um, is, is that, is that, did I get that quote correct? And I guess kind of the, is that, is that a fair and reasonable statement? Yeah, look, I, look it is. I think the values of my family at the time was, you know, you need to do worthwhile things. They tried to get me to the public service, which I would have gone mad, but, um, but, but, but you, you, I always felt that, that you just said, I want to be proud, but I want to give absolute value. And um, I realized after a while, I didn't like that people bought stuff and it broke down. And there's some terrible examples of that today, you know, buy things and they don't last a, a year, you know, hair dryers and mm. vacuum cleaners, they're the most, two most shocking things on the market. But so I always want to give value. And then I thought about it, well, you know, bricks last thousands of years, this is great. And then, um, and of course, we've even got better at it. I'd hate to think how long the product we're making today will last, but and that's, and they've got to be, they're beautiful. So we make beautiful things that last forever. And I never really said that, it was always my belief and it was only a few years ago that doing something in the marketing department and they're asking and we're talking about people, um, people who, who follow companies or interested in their products. They want to know what the company believes in. And it was an example. And then they asked me what I believed. And I said, I just want to make beautiful products forever. And, you know, I'd worked for the company 30 years at the time and it came out because now it's the byline and, and people, people um, connect with it because 
They'd rather be with someone who, who does something because they believe in it, not because it's a fad or, or they think they're going to get accolades or anything, but because they believe in it. Mm. How, how about then the next step? Um, if that kind of sets the scene for the next step in your career, uh, the early career, mm. I know you, you, I've just looking at your, your CV, Lindsay, it seems that you just, you got into an environment where you thrived and as a result, you just flew up the corporate ladder, so to speak. Can you describe that yeah. next kind of step in your, in your career? Yeah, well, yeah, overnight success in 20 years, as they say. <laughs> well, look, I did it tough a couple of times in my life. My parents broke up and, and you know, I took a fair bit of, lost a fair bit of bark and, you know, it wasn't very good. There was good times, there was bad times. And, um, you know, I was naturally motivated. Um, but I realised in the 19, mid-1970s, you know, the unemployment was 12%. And I thought, I have to have a job. There's no gap here. I have to have a job when I graduate. Um, anyhow, and I, so I went and got a cadetship. And I'd been sort of a bit of an average student in the first few years. I think I found, found the, other, the opposite sex was at university. But anyhow, <laughs> um, so, so I got this job and I loved it and had some terrible results. But they kept me on. They offered me a cadetship. So I had a cadetship. So I worked for them the last two years. And, but I was trialling a subject. I did, it took me five years to get my degree. Um, and anyhow, so they had this accelerated program and they wanted these young, smart, you know, kids from university to, to you know, help with this company that was growing rapidly. And um, so they um, I very quickly went through three or four positions very quickly. Uh, I was running a factory in six months. Um, I was in the United States within three years running a business over there. I mean, I always made lots of money. So, so that helped, right? The difference between me and other people, I made money, right? Um, and so... You know, I went to the United States and then, then we hit the recession in the early 80s and I, and I came back and then the, the, the recession arrived, arrived in Australia and I got that again and the company was in all sorts of turmoil and the opportunity came up to, to join Brickworks. But I'd been with that company nine years and I was running like four plants and we're making floor tiles, which is somewhat more difficult than bricks. But uh, so anyway, so I, I took a step back. I came back to get in Brickworks. I took a step back at the, the factory manager. Um, and the first 12 months was pretty tough. It was, it was a plant that was in very, very poor condition. Actually, actually it's the one we're demolishing at the moment. Um, but uh, it was a mess. And uh, anyhow, we sorted it out and it took 12 months. And then we made, we made a lot of money. And so I became operations manager and we made a lot of money. <laughs> and then I became a general manager and I was there for 10 years. And anybody who looking at their career, if you want to really go to the top, you need to be GM in your early 30s and you need to do it for 10 years. Because it's only as a general manager you really get the sort of serious problems you've got to handle and develop as a person that will stand you in good stead. And you need to have a, and also you need to have a number of big setbacks in your life. Because if you don't know know how to handle setbacks, you can't know how to recover, regroup, and get on. A lot of people have a setback in their life, even you know, and they never recover their whole life. That could happen in their childhood. They never recover, and and there's always they bear this thing, this chip on their shoulder their whole life. I'd be okay if, but you know, or, or if mm. not for. Um, you know, forget all that, you know, get up, dust yourself off and just get back into it. And so anyhow, I was GM and then I became a deputy um, CEO. Um, the company was only five plants in two states and had the souls holding. And uh, and then I took over in 99 as CEO and, and then MD. And I've been MD here now for 20 years. Mm. So, um, but yeah, I mean, but the thing about the surviving the 20 years is I haven't made any great mistakes and I've never ripped up a lot of the company's money and I've only had a couple of years when we've gone backwards. Normally the profit's been going forwards and um, during that period of time, you know, the shares have gone up fivefold. So I think the shareholders are pretty happy with me and, um, you know, but I, I never think every day, I think I'm just a hired gun. The, the first day I start missing, I'm fired. Um, you know, so, you know, and you've got to realise that. So I've got to give value every day. I'm an expensive piece of item for the shareholders to pay for and uh, I've got to deliver results. And that's it. If I don't, I'm out. So. Mm. Before we get to, I guess, um, how you think about leadership and how you've had to evolve um, your style over time, mm. maybe you can just explain Brickworks from the 30,000 foot view, um, but maybe you can frame it too with where it started and how it's evolved. Yeah, look, it's best to follow the history, then you get it. But um, eventually, originally in, in the early 30s, uh, a gentleman by the name of William King Dawes, um, who owned the Austral Brick Company, amongst others, um, and had been originally been a truck driver uh, delivering bricks. Um, there, there was the state government was involved in bricks. And of course, in those days, there was ACCC or, or laws against people interacting. And, um, there was 40 something brickmakers in Sydney and they'd, they'd, they'd go to the meeting and he'd lock the door and put a bottle of um, 
gin on the table and, and sit there and drink the gin. And he said, we'll, we'll leave when we agree on the price rise. <laughs> right. So anyhow, the state government got into making bricks and that was the brick plants out of Homebush. So they put in um, a couple of hundred thousand dollars each and they, or pounds then, I guess, um, formed Brickworks Limited and Brickworks Limited bought the state government out of uh, making bricks at Homebush. The government changed, the government bought it back, it changed again, Brickworks bought it back. The government changed again, the state government bought it back, and then the state government kept it. They ran it to the late 60s. They lost money every year for 30 years. Um, you know, eventually, they, they knocked it down, of course, and built the Olympic site there. So that, that was the beginning of it. And then he, William King Dawes folded in his other company, so he got the majority. He got a shareholding, got controlling. I think we were on the New South Wales Exchange, early 60s. We went on the um, national, the ASX when it first started, national exchange. Um, so I think it was 61 or 62. And they're worried about being taken over by London Brick. So um, they realized there was another company on the stock exchange called Washington H. Sol Patterson, uh, SOL, Sol. So we, everyone calls it Sol. Mm. And we were both the same size, the interesting number, 20, about $26 million. Anyhow, they swapped their million shares. And um, the, the old directors used to tell me the story that the papers the next day said um, uh, um, directors on drugs. Uh, shareholders get brickbats, right? <laughs> and that was the heading, and I've got it somewhere. But, but so um, they swapped the million shares, and then each started buying um, shares in each other's company, which, when you think about it, maybe wasn't the smartest thing. It was, it was like a share buyback, but it wasn't very efficient. Mm. Um, and that went up to 89, and then ASIC said no more. Um, and at that point, I think Sol's owned 49.9 of us, and we owned 43% of them. Um, but the company had got itself into the William King Dawes got old and tired and died in the early 80s and the company had fallen to pieces we were in a bit of trouble and uh i got invited to join in 85 and, and you know we really had to rebuild the company it was like going into berlin the day after world war ii i mean they literally had a bonfire in the yard and burned half the documents the night before we arrived um, and we had to put everything back together right um from scratch and which was done and i had a good good boss and a good good leader at that point of time to do that uh, a gentleman by the name of alan bentley who was um, my predecessor and so there's only been four managing directors in the whole time right. um, since, since the 30s through to now, so 90 years. Um, and that stability and that understanding about the business, you know, is, is one of our strengths. Um, so anyhow, that's all right. So um, I took over in 99 and, um, and Rob took over as chairman and we're a new team and, and we started growing the business. And so we started buying other plants and competitors and things. And the, the, the main ones was we bought Bristol in 03, which was the other half of this. Australia, which made us national. Um, we had all this land and eventually the approvals were coming through and, and we, we looked for a partner and, and we found and we made an unbelievably good decision. Um, you don't get them all right, but the odd good one helps mm. with uh, joining up with Goodman. Um, and we started developing the natural land and, then, and we were selling it off. But my view was, I never know whether I was going to get good value. And I'd seen the company sell off a lot of land earlier on and I thought we hadn't got good value. If you're selling it off for residential, that's it. There's no further position. But when you're industrial, there was this idea, this trust. And so it took me a few years to convince the um, board to get in the trust. And actually, it was about 03 or 04 we got going. And we we're only a couple of years into it, of course. We hit the GFC and the, and the valuations went the wrong way. And we had to tip in, I think, about $20 million. I think my name was Mud that year. Um, <laughs> And, but then after that, it just went from strength to strength and it's, it's kept growing. And of course, and today that's, you know, 2 billion and soon to be $3 billion worth. And Can you, you know, we, we own Lindsay, about 700 million of it. <clears throat> Lindsay, sorry to interrupt. Can you explain the difference there just for people that um, aren't familiar with, um, I guess, the, the warehouse, you know, leasing, that type of thing versus just selling it off in residential? Like what makes it so appealing? Well, I mean, in all cases, you want to get to the highest and best use before you do anything with it. So that means you need to get the DA. If it needs services, you've got to put it in or whatever. Mm. Um, and we realised this land would take a lot of um, extra money to do it. And the way the deal works with Goodman is that we put in the raw land. We had cows running on it. Mm -hmm. They put the services. In, and usually that's about, you know, if the land's worth a dollar, the, the services are worth a dollar. And if it's a bit above, a bit below, there's usually a bit of a balancing payment. And then um, you've got a $2 piece of land then. Um, and then if you put a shed on it, you can borrow the money against the land and say that's $2. So you get 50% gearing. You've got a, now you've got a, a shed with, with um, on a block of land that's worth $4, 50% gearing. We own 25, we own, you know, uh, half of it, but it's geared. So 25% of the total asset. 
Yep. And and but you're you're getting a rent, and the rent's coming in every every year, and then the values change, and what we've seen is cap rate compression. In other words, interest rates have gone down, and people are, it's good value, it's good position. People are chasing it, prepared to pay more, and the value has gone up. And and the outcome is that the, you know gearing is much less than what it started off, and um, and you know we've got a, a, a every warehouse is full because it's um, on a long term lease. Mm. So you benefit, you know, you've got that strategic partner who can who can do their bit. But yeah. then you, you can supply the land and benefit longer term from it. Yeah, but the real trick is the real trick in there is that what I say. What the first thing they had to come to it took me a lot of years to understand it. If you're trying to put an industrial warehouse up and it doesn't stack up, it means the raw land's too expensive because that's the only number that can change, right? Mm. Um, and so you've got to stop and put it in. You think it's, it's, I'm not getting the full value for it. But if you follow on, you know you're going to pick it up over time. So when it gets when it gets serviced, the, the building PCs it gets valued. That's, you're going to get half, you, any gap that was wrong, you've picked up half it. Then every year you get a rental increase, you get a revaluation. And over time, if it was ever wrong, it, it gradually comes back to, in the end, you've got exactly half of that value. You've got all your value back. Um, and the other thing was you had to prepare to share it with somebody else to do it because it was beyond our capacity to do it. We, we couldn't afford the infrastructure. It was, it was huge. Um, and so we were able to put our rural land in and then, you know, next thing we've got, we got an income coming in. Um, Mm. Yeah, well, that was thirty million dollars. Um, you know, so it, it was it's it's worked out very 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 well, um, and it's been great to be associated with a very professional um, operation that, that Goodman is. Mm. I heard you say on a recent in a recent interview that, um, and and this caught me off guard, Lindsay. So I heard you say that Brickworks has a fifty percent share of the market for bricks in New York City or New York. Mm. Um, I didn't. I really didn't know this. And then there was some history. There's some interesting history there with the Chrysler building. So you've got the the property development arm. There's a the ownership structure with um, Seoul, um, but you've also got this really impressive bricks business that's not only here in Australia but internationally as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, look. I think you know Australia is a small space, and we we already had you know 45 or 50 percent market share here, which we couldn't grow. Um, and we didn't want to, yeah, so initially I started, you know, I got into masonry, I got into tiles and some of those could grow. And then, then I thought, you know, I'm going to get into trivial things that are going to be really hard to make money. And we made a couple of mistakes. We got into Oswest Timbers. It didn't work out. We're buying, tim, you know, trees from the government. Oh, it's a nightmare. We, we never knew where we were and how long we had. So um, we got out of that. We, we, we took our medicine. We got out and we've tightened the business up. But I needed, we, we need to grow. The operating part of the business needs to grow. So. Um, I had worked in the US, I knew the industry well, I'd been going there all my life. I knew two of our major suppliers were in the US. Um, it was natural. So I, I had um, a company spend a year knocking on the door of every big company in the US and we did a map of every single company. You've got to do your homework when you're going to make a big step. You've really got to do your homework. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had volumes about it. And, uh, and anyhow, because we were there, um, Ibstock who wanted to get out there, a UK company, um, wanted to get out of America, they had a company called Glengarry and they put it on the market because they knew there was going to be some competition with us coming into the market. And, and uh, you know, we, then we managed to pick Glengarry up because Glengarry was the fourth biggest producer in the US um, and it makes a lot of architectural and, and custom work. Um, so in, in New York, every building gets um, examined every five years and, and a lot of them are you know, getting quite old and they're all high rise brick. And as you imagine, the environment's pretty tough. It's freezing in winter and very hot in summer. Mm. A lot of them, they start to crack at the corners and things. So um, they've got to get repaired and they've got to be repaired with the bricks that were originally supplied. Well, one of the plants we picked up was called Hanley. It's in Pennsylvania. We've got five plants in Pennsylvania. And it was a custom plant and it had been around, you know, 100 years and, and it made bricks for all these buildings. And one of them was the Chrysler building. We supplied the Chrysler building in the early 30s. And here we are today supplying the bricks for its renovations, you know, all, all these years later. So. Um, that that heritage, you know, is amazing. We get about twice the price of our bricks as the people supplying for housing, and um, sixty six percent of our work goes into architectural specification, whether that be the non residential, we do schools, we do hospitals, universities, we do the ch chains of, you know, when they build, when we have a chain in Australia, you get two or three hundred McDonald's or whatever, and it'll cover the country. Well, over there, it's like three, four, five thousand. So you get you know, fifty thousand bricks into a store, and, and they're building three thousand. I mean, it's just it's great business. Um, so that's what we do. And then we consolidated that area. We made some hard decisions that, that other people hadn't made and sort of turned into a pretty decent business in under two years. 
I know the the structure and uh, I know the structure and, and cross shareholding has uh, it, it, over time um, been a topic of discussion in the media with analysts, investors, etc. But one thing I, I touched on with Rob um, Rob Milner, who's on the show recently, is I guess some of the some of the enduring principles that go into making a business that can you know beat the market from an investor's perspective, mm-hmm. deliver dividends, um, and just generally survive. Like there's not many businesses on the ASX that you can look back decades of the history and go, that's impressive. I'm just from a high level, and if we kind of exclude leadership, because we'll get to that in just a moment, but is there something, I guess, unique in the structure of Brickworks? Is it the industry that has enabled it to stand the test of time? Yes, and it goes back to that um, cross shareholding. See, you know, building products is, is a very volatile business. A lot of businesses are volatile. Mm. And you've got to think of it, you know, when the market goes ta- you know, tanks, you know, how are you going to survive? It's a very point to grace. How are you going to survive if your main business is, is underwater? Um, and so you have to have, you know, you either got to have very low or no gearing, or you got to have some other sources of income that aren't related. You know, they say underlying thematic, you know, it's, it's mm. unrelated to what you're doing. And of course, the souls gives us that. It gives us an investment in a whole range of other areas. And in the early years, and we could make no money out of bricks. And that happens pretty regularly, believe it or not. Maybe every five, seven years or 10 years, we're going to have a, we're going to have a tough year. We're not going to make any money. Uh, well, first thing, we've got depreciation, so we, we, we cut everything right back and we can live on the cash flow from depreciation as long as we're not losing money. But sometimes you even lose money. Um, then when you've got the income from this investment, you can pay your dividend. And so we've paid a dividend every year. It was only one year, 1975 was the only year we ever uh, reduced the dividend. Mm-hmm. So we've had 44 years since then where the dividend has stayed flat or gone up. Um, and Souls has achieved 20 years of rising dividends. So that strength, that financial strength, and of course, what we've done with the property, so that, that investment in Souls is about half the business because it, it's grown very well. But now the next quarter of the business is the investment in sheds. So you look at the income from our, our, our industrial trust and Souls, that pays our dividend. Mm-hmm. That's 75% of our investments, right? So 75% of Brickworks are our investments. So when they used to use the coin that Brickworks was a blue chip company, you know, that's I think what people mean. And the gearing's very low. And to, only 25% of the assets are in, in building products. And a lot of people have trouble understanding that. But that, that's great. The building products, it can grow and it can create opportunities and gives us cash flow and, and does all sorts of things. And this 75% of investments, you know, gives us the, the ability to survive really tough times and um, you know, keep our shareholders happy. And this year we paid a dividend and it was increased, you know, and a lot of, a lot of companies didn't pay any dividend this year. Mm. So I guess for you as a, as the leader of the business, the manager, you're thinking, you know, you've got this consistent um, cross shareholding, this effectively dividend payer for you, and then you can apply your, your wares to, to focusing on growth in the business. Like you said, international business is really important to you. How about when it comes to things like, um, I guess, the, the culture of the business and general, um, I guess, ways of doing business at Brickworks? Are there any kind of mantras or, 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 or principles that you live by to keep costs low, to focus on innovation and those types of things? Yeah, you know, and, um, and I guess it's changed over time too. This is, this is another story. But look, we, um, businesses need the rhythm. And, you know, before I go home, I've got to know how many bricks I sold today. Hmm. end of the week i got to know how much profit did we make this week some of my factory managers even do daily profit they know how much fa- profit that factory made today so it's rhythm um you need good communication you know and so with modern technology that's very easy you know we we at the moment we video link up first thing monday morning and say hello to everybody and then we have a management meeting that runs two hours at the end of the week which lets the senior people know what happened this week within the company and then 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 a lot of them wander off and then then we go through the results of every single plant uh, and that happens every week. Um, and that's, that's rhythm, you know, and this plant's not performing or we're not getting the sales there or whatever, so on the problems. And also it means that I'm interacting, you know, way down deep in the organisation. Some people might call that a con- control freak, but, but you know, if, if you don't know what's going on, I mean, hey, how, do you, how, do you, how do you control it? So um, you've got to know the business intimately, really intimately. Um, and, you know, I think, I think we generally do, and yet you still get surprises. <laughs> there's, there's always somebody who's got a, another idea or, or somebody who's having a bad month and they, and they decide that they won't show their full expenses and try and hide them. And then the next month, they have another bad month and another bad month. Next thing you know, they're in trouble and they're, of course, they're fired. Um, 
But and, and you know that happens. That happens unbelievably regularly. But uh, people, for whatever reason, they do these things instead of saying, "I'm in trouble. Can you help me?" You know. Yeah. Um, but you try and encourage people to come forward and, and say they help. But but often, you know, human beings are funny. They have their own mind. I mean, people say to me, well, "But you're the boss. Can't you get them to do this or do that?" I said, "Well, no, I can't. I can ask them, but they they won't necessarily do it. Right? <laughs> they know better than me. That they think, you know. So they might. <laughs> but I mean, so I'm a, bit, I'm a bit pragmatic. I guess over time I've become a bit more um, reserved, <laughs> a, bit, a bit milder. <laughs> but that's required these days. You know, we, we've got you know, mixed audiences. It's not like it was a, as it used to be a male domain and issues were sorted out behind the, uh, behind the grinding shed, you know, in, in the early years. And those, those days are gone. So that's, it's an interesting uh, point you bring up, like the kind of the, the evolution in the way that you manage. Um, you've got 1400 employees around the world or obviously thereabouts. How would you describe the way that you lead? Um, and this is going to be an interesting answer because there are, CEOs, there are business leaders that listen to this podcast, mm -hmm. but how would you describe the way that you lead? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a different, leadership is a different thing from management and um, leadership is a bit, I mean, that's where people get confused. They get, they get mm, to between leadership and management, right? Um, but leadership, leadership is about, you know, being able to see the vision and, and then encouraging other people to willingly want to follow it. Right. And um, that's something that, you know, might be easy to describe, but it's very hard for people to recreate and you don't always get it right. Um, mm. You know, and, and you know, how you're going to motivate people is, is an interesting story in itself. But um, yeah, and that's where companies go wrong. I think companies, if they can't see what, what does this company, what does this person believe in? Well, they know what I believe in. I tell them, right. right. And where, where's the vision? Well, you know, we want to be, for years, we want to be the best, um, building price company in Australia, you know, mm. now, you know, we, we've got this other vision, we're going to grow in another country. So they know exactly where we're going. And that's all we talk, you know, they, 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 they feel comfortable with, with where we're going. And if they don't feel comfortable, of course, over to, after the time they, they move on. But mm. and, and if, they, 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 if they're successful, they get promoted. And the best thing you can do to get people on, on the side is for them to get promoted and to grow in themselves and their career and their financial well-being. By, by getting promoted, if they want to be. Not everybody wants to be, but if they want that opportunity to make sure it's available. So I've got to make opportunities available for people. Now, if I fail to make opportunities available for them, and then, then they'll go elsewhere. They won't be happy with my leadership. Mm. How about then, how would you define your, your management approach? If, if, you're, if you're keenly focused on, you know, obviously leadership is about vision and about getting people to follow you. How would you define the way you manage um, as opposed to leadership? You have a tough yeah, question. Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yes and no. Um, you know, your, your management style, I mean, you've got to get things done. You've got to have the go gene. You've got to have a bit of mongrel because you're going to have to sort out some tough problems. You've got to be agile because you're going to get problems that you've never seen before and no one else can fix. You've got to fix them. But, you know, in the end, they all go, well, you get rid of your problems in the end, but you've got to get rid of them. So you've got to be that. You've got to, you, you, you've got to uh, be beating the drum, you know, setting the rhythm of the business. The business has got to have rhythm. People want rhythm. They want to know what, what, it's expected of them what are they going to do to be successful um mm. and you've got to drive that framework but one of the most important things i learned very early in my career when i got put into uh, unwinnable positions the most important thing i've got to do as a manager is make sure my junior managers have a winnable proposition and 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 if they're failing i've got to make that proposition so they can win um mm. otherwise they'll, they'll they'll very quickly um they'll turn up in your office looking gray and and they're shot um, mm. and, Time then for them to, to go, but um, what's a winnable like, proposition? Sorry, well, winnable. Well, you got to give them a game that they can win, right? And mm. and the the, 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 the duty of the, to me, the man at the top, is to make sure everyone's got a, got got a, a set of things that they can win at, you mm. know. Um, and as you get higher up, the organisation that becomes bigger. Right? But, but but yeah, I mean, and a lot of people don't understand that. You put something like no, we keep throwing guys in there, and they all keep failing. We can't work out what's going wrong. Well, maybe what you've given them is not a winnable position. Mm. You've got to give them a winnable position. And sometimes that might need some capex or it might need restructuring or, you know, the harder things you've got to restructure the industry, mm. right? Or you've got to decide to get out of it. Right? Um, those decisions are more difficult, but, um, mm. but that's, you've got to have winnable. And then people, then they, they feel happy because they, they can control their life and, and they're making progress. But if, they, if you're in a losing situation and you see no end to it, like the virus, the pandemic goes on forever and there's never a vaccine, you know, um, there's no hope and, and, and people get 
it becomes so soul destroying and they, and they give up. Mm. You mentioned, um, I guess, making opportunities available for people as a way to incentivize them. I know even today, as we record, you've got some, some investor calls lined up and I imagine over your tenure, you've spoken to thousands, probably investors who are looking at Brickworks, asking you questions, um, whether it be analysts, institutions, what have you. Charlie Munger has the quote, show me where I'm going to die and I won't go there as a kind of the, the ultimate incentive, right? <laughs> and I, I, I always think about this because I, I sit on analyst calls, you know, every other week and I think some of the questions that people are asking just aren't the right questions. They're very myopic, very short-term focused. But if you were looking from the outside in, you're looking into staring through the windows of Brickworks HQ and you're, you're trying to get a sense of like how people are incentivized and, and what long-term investors should be looking for. What would you say, you know, what would you say are the key points for the way you incentivize people and get them aligned longer term? Yeah, well, picking up on Charlie Munger's statement, the other one is, you know, a boat safe in the harbour, but that's not, not what boats are for. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> well, there's got to be, you know, how do you incentivize people? And part of us are going to say, yeah, you know, you can think of the long term salary and that, but, but, People want more than salary. I never joined the company for the salary. That was just something that came. That was an mm. out, outcome of it, right? Um, people want, they want some excitement too. They don't want to be, think, I'm just going to be doing the same thing. You know, they've got to think that the, the company's growing and there's, and there's going to be an opportunity for them, but they've always got to think that their role is developing and evolving. Uh, otherwise, they'll become bored. Um, they will they go join the public service, as I said before, if you want to do that. Um, so you've got to create some excitement. You've got to have some fun too. You've got to celebrate your successes. I mean, people talk about those things. You've got to do them. They're, they're, they're expected. You know, you've got to, your, your boss has got to um, acknowledge your little wins. Um, and often that's done in private and people, people see it. And maybe sometimes it's done in public. And, but all those things sort of go together towards motivating people. People want a, a nice environment. But one of the difficult things I found in my life is, is that you've always got one asshole in your life. You just, it just, it just and you can't do anything about them, you know? And I, <laughs> well, how do I, what do I do? How do I get away from this? You know, so um, I, I have a no asshole rule, and I hunt around the organisation. If I can find one, I'll get rid of them because every person around them is miserable. Mm. Right? And if you start losing people out of a division, what's going on here? Why are all these people leaving? You know, because we want people to stay. We want them to come stay with us all their life. We don't want them to leave. So if there's someone that's that's stirring up the, you know, stirring up things up, you know, we'll, we'll try and, you know. Get rid of them mm. and, um, and and make make people's life enjoyable. They they feel they can contribute. It's a very hard thing, isn't it? If you're looking from the outside, unless you you come and visit um, the office mm. or you, you go into a showroom or something like, that, it's very hard to get a sense of that that culture. So, it's it's I guess these conversations that we rely on to understand mm. how you try and embrace that. Mm. One of the questions that I have on my list, Lindsay, is you obviously you know Brickworks is a multi billion dollar company. Um, you still find time to meet with investors like myself. How do you decide each day how you allocate your time? You've, you've mentioned, you know, once a week you have these meetings. And sometimes they go for a few hours. Is there anything in your routine that I guess lends itself and, and I guess enables you to keep growing as an individual? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's a bit like allocated capital. I know that's what you've got for later on. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, a lot of it, you don't get much choice. I mean, I, you got, I got a lot of freedom, but I know, you know, certain days of the year I'm going to be, doing board meetings i'm going to be doing agms and i'm going to spend a week talking to investors and i've got that's that's all booked in and i've got those other standing meetings and all fixed up but someone once said uh you allocate your, your time to the to the things that if you didn't do no one else would um and that's an interesting saying and there's maybe one of the reasons why you know before the board comes i always check the washers because i know no one else will <laughs> but i can get you into some menial tasks but but in reality but in in reality you have to focus on your problems um you know you don't get too many joyous moments you've got to focus and sort out the problems if you don't sort out the problems no one else will and they're the hardest problems and some things you know there's a bad accident or whatever or, you know, captain's got to be on the bridge. The leader has to lead. If you're going to lead, you've got to be out there, visible, seen, leading, you know, so people know that you're there. Um, and, mm. and, you know, but so you've got to drop everything. You've got to have enough spare capacity in the way you allocate your time that if a little crisis comes up, you can handle it, um, that there's a capacity there to do it. And the big thing about growing with the business is that you've got to, I've had to completely reorganise 
we grow it a bit more, we reorganize a bit so we get that back into that situation it's all in balance. I've got everything controlled and we grow a bit more and I've got to build a structure a little bit more and that mm. goes on. But I've always got spare capacity to, to focus on the growth of the company, mm. fo focus on crises that we didn't know were going to come along, which is most, I think that's the definition of a crisis. You didn't know it was going to come. Um, and, and, and then, you know, make sure you're keeping a rhythm of the business and getting it going in the direction you want. If you, if, do you, do you do things each day where, for example, you carve time out of the day just to sit back and talk and, um, or even just think? Is there particular times of each day where you just read or, or do anything like that? I'm always interested in kind of those, those principles around, as a leader, trying to be mindful of yourself and, and those around you. That's about 3 a.m. in the morning when you're going <laughs> over, you know, my own personal issues and, and the company's issues and what have I got to do and, you know, set the, set the scene and, um, mm. you know, and what's going to happen and what I've got to handle today. And, um, but, you know, it's, it's after 20 odd years, it's, I've got a pretty good crew. I, I, I know where most things are coming from. And it's, uh, I've also worked out how to de-risk things over time. I mean, one mm. of the problems with these companies that churn their CEOs so quickly, they never learn. The CEO never gets a chance to see, well, I made that decision and what was the outcome? Where well, I've mm. got to see the outcome, then go back to the beginning on the next time I'd like build a plant or something and then de-risk it. And so they have all these crises like we just never have, mm. right? As you know, we used to tell the young supervisor, and you look for the Exocet missiles on the horizon and get rid of them straight away. And you want it back to the horizon. You want to look at the horizon and have no crises anywhere. Like I've got no problems are gonna come in, you know, and as a CEO, you're gonna be living, I live in a time frame five to 20 years out from here. You know, a factory manager needs to be living, you know, six months from where they are. A general manager, maybe two years. And if you're not living in a world two years in front of where you are, you're going to get hit beset by crises all the time. And a lot of people don't have maybe the cognitive ability to think, put themselves in a time frame years and years from where they are and, and what they want that to look like and then set about achieving it. Um, they're not mm. able to move up and down the timeline. The same mm. as I find they're not able to up, look up and down the production line and work out that the problem that they got that the packaging plant was caused back, you know, out in the clay shed sort of thing. Mm. It's, I'm, gra I'm glad you kind of, uh, you brought in the idea of this longer term horizon because over the last um, two years, I believe it is, um, Brickworks and your partners at, at Goodman have, have announced these big deals um, and projects. We've seen the, um, you know, the Amazon warehouse, which is this incredible facility uh, in New South Wales, and then an upgraded warehouse with Coles. Um, for our listeners who aren't familiar with these projects, can you just uh, describe a bit about, you know, describe them as a, a, an undertaking for you? And I guess uh, what might come next in that space? Mm, yeah. And look, and they do take a lot of years to, you know, maybe a year or two in discussions before they, the pre-lease happens. And, you know, we have to put, bring together the land and the services and all, get all the approvals and, mm. and then construct them and, the Amazon building has got twice the amount of steel in it as the Eiffel Tower, to give you some idea of the scale. Wow. Um, and this is a fundamental change. You know, warehouses used to be cross docking, you know, semi-trailer in this side, semi-trailer out that side. What we've got now with the click and collect and the, and the ordering online, you've got semi-trailer in one side and then delivery van out the other. And our land is perfectly located for that near the M4, M7 junction. You can get to anywhere in Sydney, you know, most places in 30 minutes. So it, it's very good. But but they're massive buildings. They're 10 stories high. Um, the, the ground footprint on Amazon Coles are about the same, about a dozen football fields. Um, but Amazon has got various levels. There's is almost 40 football fields in space. Um, wow. So they're massive, massive buildings. Um, and and they've got Coles, Coles and, and Amazon have got different um, systems. Coles is a... Uh, like an automated um, you know, a device, that a robot that right, goes up and picks pallets out, whereas the Amazon's the one with the robots where all the robots move around with the stillage on them with the, the various items and they bring it to the person who's got to do pick and pack. Um, quite different setups. But, mm. but they're a whole new thing. And I think there's going to be a lot more of these. Um, the buildings are worth about twice the value of the, the standard building because they're so high and they rent for about twice as much. Um, they take, they take twice as long to build. We could build a normal, you know, uh, 50,000 metre warehouse in, in six months, but, but these things take a year. I mean, it's amazing what you can put up compared to building a house. You know, we built these massive buildings and at the time you build a residential cottage. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen some footage of 
of what they would look like and, and um, some of the robotics that goes into them. Um, this, I guess this theme of um, the shift towards, you know, this digital economy um, is such an enormous opportunity, at least from my perspective, it seems like it's just such an enormous opportunity. It comes with its challenges, sure. Um, how are you positioning the company to, to benefit from some of these trends? Are, they, are you looking, actively looking for more of these deals and to set yourself up with Goodman in that respect? Oh, we're always, we're always there and we're trying to keep the, you know, from our part of it, we've got to keep the land up to them, um, mm. which is part of the reason why we're building these other new brickworks and things, you know, we're making, we're vacating land, which I think has got a higher and better use as industrial land and concentrating the brick operations to land, which has a lower value and more suitable for the brick making. Um, so we've got to keep it feeding that way. But the, the digital impact is, you know, every, I mean, the new factories we're building ourselves, I mean, the, the, the automation and the, it's amazing. I mean, the factories we were building 10 years ago were amazing, but the ones we're building now are, you know, just another level again, we double the productivity of what we had 10 years ago. So mm. it's come a long way. Um, the reliability of the systems is, is so much better. Um, but yeah, look, I think this is, it's only going to accelerate. This is going to happen in everything we're doing. Um, you know, everything from communication, the, the way we interact with our friends and family and the way we buy things and it's changing in the way that they're made you know, and delivered and just distributed. It's just, it's going to evolve and a lot of it makes life easier, isn't it? I mean, mm. I, I don't, I'm that lazy. I don't even go down to the Dan Murphy's. I, you know, you just order it one night <laughs> through the week. It turns up, you know, a few days later, like it, it's easy. You get, you get the life back. But um, you have to, which you come back to one of the questions you asked before. I mean, um, one of the things of being my age and, you know, my kids left home and that is that the amount of hours you actually got to apply to the job. Mm. Uh, you know, so you're not distracted, but all that behind you has just got to happen, you know, because you've got to, to get the volume done, you get everything done that you need to get done. You have to have a lot of time, uh, uninterrupted time. And so you need all that automation behind you and you need helpers to make it happen. Yeah. Is this, a, is this something that excites you being able to play a role in that and thinking that five to 10 years, five to 20 years, sorry, out into the future, positioning brick plants, moving them on, you know, what could come next? Is that a really exciting part of well, your Well, that's, that's my legacy. Um, you know, I spoke about my father earlier on, but he was one of a, a string of engineers going back like 300 years. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, would like to be the legacy, you know, like Lindsay built that plant, you know, and my chief mm. engineer, we built that plant, you know, and we do, we sit in the drawings and we work it out. And there might be 50 drawings before we get to one we're happy with. We sort out all the little issues, but and using the knowledge we built, we de-risked it. We got certain ways we de-risked them, so we know it's going to work. But there's no question about it, it's going to work, right? Um, mm. And we'll get there very quickly. You know, people build things that don't understand what they're doing, and then they, they get themselves into trouble. You know, but, mm. but um, you know that comes from doing it a lot of times and, and sorting out any issues along the way. And um, yeah, yeah, and so it works, and then it makes a lot of money for the company. You know, and it does it then for forty years. You know. Um, so they're, they're, it's a great thrill to be able to do that. And might be one of the things why I keep working because I've got all these factories I've got to build before I can retire. <laughs> so. this, is an, this is an interesting point. Um, we, we, we didn't talk about this previously, but um, how like your technical ability has informed you as a, a director, as a leader now, a manager, all of that. I often look at companies and there's not um, someone with the technical skills at the helm. So you often see CEOs that, you, for, you know, maybe they're not professional CEOs, but they just don't have the technical ability. Mm. When, I guess this is a very generalized question, uh, Lindsay, but has that been a great advantage to you? Do you think you could have achieved what you've achieved without being a ceramics engineer? No, not at all. I mean, I don't know how, how do you have a company that, that, that makes widgets and the guy who, or woman who's running it doesn't know anything about widgets? I mean, I don't, I don't know how that works. I mean, what are you going to do? You go down, go down the street, you buy, you buy a widget factory from a, a person who focuses on widgets, and what happens if they go broke halfway through it? Who's going to build it? The rest of it? Well, yeah. That doesn't worry us. We, 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 we can do all that. You know, we actually now design a lot of our own equipment and stuff. And but you know, even the problems in the plant. I mean, the factory manager tells you, you know, X Y Z is wrong, and and I and I'll say that's not your problem. Your problem's over here. You know, like you know, I know all the factories in the back of my head. I got a blueprint of every factory we own in the back of my head. Mm. I know the strengths and weaknesses of every single one, you know, and the factory manager comes in and he tells me something, you know, and I know he's, he's not telling me the truth, you know, so, or he doesn't know. And you go tell him how to fix it. And that's, um, you know, I don't know how you run a business if you don't know this. I might say that's over detail, but, but I tell you what, you're gonna have a lot of problems if you don't, if you can't see things going wrong and fixing them. You have enough when you can, right? Mm. I hate to imagine what goes on 
companies when they when they don't know really what they're doing yeah. mm. because you often see that right like there's there's two parts of every business there's the i guess the mm. operating part the component and then there's the capital allocation component sometimes mm. ceos fail at one but can survive with another but you seem to be equally you know adept at both of those um you've mm. got the obviously the technical and operating ability but also the i guess the nous when it comes to capital allocation um so there's just a few more questions I have for you, Lindsay, before um, I know you've got a few other interviews and, and uh, investor meetings to get to today, but I just want to know, just generally speaking, how you spend, spend your spare time. <laughs> okay, I thought you were going to ask me about the capital allocation. <laughs> oh, well, let's, let's talk about capital. <laughs> I, we... I spend my spare time worrying about the brickworks uh, because they never stop, you know. It's, it, I, I picked <laughs> on the 15th of, of May in 1985, and I haven't, I haven't had a, you know, I've been available the whole time, you know, 35 <laughs> years. But so we do a spare time, you know, sometimes, oh, yeah, we blew this up and that, you know. But no, I look, I look, I'm a bit like the story I told you before, you know, I've done a lot of things in my spare time um, over my life, and I, I didn't want to get to my deathbed and think, well, do I really want to do that? And so I've got involved in things that have moved on. I've had boats, I've had ski boats and cruises, and I've gone fishing and played golf and all those sorts of things. And, um, and then I bought a farm um, just when the drought started, so that wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, I like to do a bit of hunting now. I got some mates. We love getting. I love getting out in the country with with the country people. I think it's the salt of the earth. It's great. And mm. Go stay some little pub somewhere and meet the locals, and you know, and go talk to a farmer and, and help them out with some stuff. It's uh, it's do that. And I obviously got to try and spend as much time as I can with my wife, and we, we can't now, but you know, travel mm. when we can and. Um, with your kids and all those sorts of things. Um, there's other obligations you have in life that, that you really enjoy doing. Um, but For you sure. know, the, the, if I can just leave you with one thing, you know, mm. you, when your, young, your kid comes to you and says, Dad, you know, what should I do with my life? Well, there's only one answer. Go do something you enjoy. And then you never work a day in your life. You know, every day, I, I can't wait to get to work, you know, because every day I, I love it, you know, mm. uh, it's fun. I love, I love it. I feel like, but I feel like that's a fitting way to end the conversation, Lindsay. But I've got to ask you about your capital allocation now. So, <laughs> so. well, well that is, you don't really get a lot of choice because, because first of all, you know, you come, you got say you're going to spend your depreciation, right? First of all, you know, you got the safety things. Well, no safety issue ever gets knocked back and just goes straight through. Yep. Um, then you've got the ones that the government wants you to do for the environment or whatever, and there's this new scrubber or there's something, okay, good. But, <laughs> and then I've got the ones that if I don't spend, the plant's going to stop because the kiln cars are rusted out or the stack's about to fall over. So you've got to do them. And then you think, what have I got left? And now I can spend the money on the things that actually make more money for the company. And, I've got, and the list of them is long, this long. <laughs> so you try and work it out. But, the, but let's talk about the big ones. Like the plant we're building at the moment is $125 million. Like we can't get it wrong. So I always think about I need a couple of ways it's going to make money and I've got to have a couple of fallback positions just in case the world doesn't turn out as I think it's going to turn out, right? And the thing with this one is how it's got the fallback position is the money's not in the profit that the plant's going to make in the future and it will. The money's in, in, in the value of the land that's underneath the current plant that's running. Mm. That, that will pay for the new plant three, four, five times over before we even start. So that's my first return there, right? So I've made mm. that, and right? I've put some sheds on, that's good. Then we've built the factory, and we've built 10 of these factories in the last 10 years. So, and it's just upgraded a couple of little things from the last one. So we know it's gonna go, right? And it's gonna be base load capacity, right? So we know it's always gonna be under load because we've got all these other plants that were old and tired that could close down. So we know it's gonna go flat out. We know it's gonna work. We know it's gonna make a lot of money, right? So that's it. So that, that's where people go wrong. They, 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 borrow money for the company, they invest it either by acquiring another company or building an asset, and it doesn't work. Well, that's, that's your shit, your career up. So you better make sure you're right. And mm. I'm stunned at the lack of due diligence. As I said to you, we spent 18 months crawling over every brickmaker in the US before we went there. Absolutely crawling over. We knew every, we knew every, every factory manager's name. We knew every piece of machinery in every factory. We knew where all their quarries were. We knew the products they made, who they sold to, everything, right, mm. before we market there was nothing left to chance it was the same with um when we bought bristol we knew everything and we'd visited everywhere we'd got ourselves into each of these plants one way or another we looked at them we looked at the lot mm. it's incredible this <clears throat> it's almost like multiple ways of winning right that's pretty much what the yeah. business is built on you know if you if you don't win on this you win on that and if you don't win on that you win on the next thing or you yeah. win on all three so yeah. uh, it's fantastic um that's a it doesn't always go right and we had a couple of failures we built a plant um at, at punch bowl to make floor tiles 
Mm. Um, we, we got, it was the, the, the company went broke. <laughs> so that was a good lesson about how to write contracts. Um, we re-tendered it. They, the company put it, it was a German company, they, the government had funded it, came back up again. We, we built, we gave them the contract. They built the plant. We started it with the first day, the tiles come out of the kiln and they're all broken. And we pulled a conveyor off and 100% of the production went straight down the waste chute. And we did that for three months. Yeah. Right. And I said, how long do you think I'm going to give you guys to do it? Anyhow, so you know, I did a bit of smart ceramic engineering and got the thing to 90% recoveries. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the floor tile market collapsed. <laughs> Jeez, life's not easy sometimes. The floor, and so we couldn't sell floor tiles. And so then we made a ceramic cladding and that went on. That didn't go so well. And then we made pavers and that didn't go too well. In there, we made 10 years after we built the plant, we made glazed bricks. Took off. Can't give up. Mm -hmm. The right? like, plant makes lots and lots of money. Right. But we, we, when we designed the plant, I thought, well, if I, can, I, if I can't make this, I can make this. And if I don't make that, I can do that. If I don't, mm. that was, and we were back to the last reserve before we got the thing to go. Um, but that just, uh, you know, shows you that just sometimes, you know, it's not just not easy and it doesn't go right. You know, things that, that go wrong out of your, out of, outside of your control. Yeah, it's one thing that um, as an investor I look for is kind of the optionality that's embedded in a business. But sometimes it's so hard because... You know, you have a lot of investors these days that use quantitative mm. methods to determine if a business is going to be a success or if it's statistically cheap or what have you. But some of those things, you, you know, you, you can't see that on the balance sheet. You have to rely on your judgment and your technical will. ability. Yeah, how, how agile is the CEO? And we measure mm. the agility of our senior executive. How agile are they? How, how do they handle a problem they've never seen before? How long does it take them to sort it out? How, how do you measure that? Is it, is it in like time or? It is an, it is a test for agility, you know, mental agility. And that's could be like, I've been working for two years on this project and I'm going to present it to the board tomorrow. And the MD comes to me and says, no, we're not doing that. We're doing something else. You've got overnight, you've got to do this other project. Mm. You know, what do you do? You go away and sulk or you just get in and get it done. That's mm. what you do. You just get in and get it done. Mm. Um, the world changed. I mean, look, look at this. Look, there's no, the pandemic. What incredible, mm. are we spat on a dime. What's the new world going to be? How are we going to change our business? Okay, that's what we're going to do. And we meet every day, every day. How are we going to get that? Right? How are we going to be that new business when we come out of this? We're going to be stronger, better company for it. And that, that, that's agility. You know? yeah. Forget what, what, what the world was before the pandemic. Who cares? That's history. Yeah. Right? If you're sitting there waiting for that to come back, well, you, you're going to be closed. <laughs> No, I, um, I, I guess um, we're, we're singing from the same songbook, Lindsay. It's, um, it's been my pleasure to speak to you because um, I just I love hearing your, your, your insights on all of these topics. So, um, mate, just thanks for taking the time out and joining me on the program. Pleasure. Pleasure. Look forward to it again. Thank you. Cheers.